Thank you all very much. Um, here on behalf of Greater Louisville Inc., we're the uh, Chamber of Commerce and also the Regional Economic Development Agency here in Louisville. Um, we've been fortunate to be sponsors of the festival for the seven years now that it's been here in town. Um, and this is sort of an economic developer's dream, right? Um, this kind of uh, caliber of spink, uh, speakers and innovative thinkers that are coming to down, the presenters that have come and experienced Louisville as a part of it, people in the audience who've come um, from here in the region and from um, places around the world, you really sort of can't ask for anything more. So we're just so grateful for the festival and everything that they've done. Um, and with that, I'll quickly get on to the introduction of our presenter today. I know uh, Ruby Lerner herself has been here for six years. This is the third year that Creative Capital has been presenting, and this is always a jam-packed session with lots to say, and so I want to make sure to leave time for that. Um, but Le uh, Ruby Lerner is the President and Executive Director of Creative Capital. Um, prior to Creative Capital, she served as Executive Director of the Association of Independent Film and Video Makers and as publisher of the highly regarded independent film and video monthly. Um, having worked re uh, regionally in both the performing arts and independent media fields, she served as the executive director of Alternative Roots, a coalition of Southeastern performing artists, and Image Film Video Center, both based in Atlanta. In the late 1970s, she was the audience development director at the Manhattan Theater Club, one of New York's foremost nonprofit theaters. Um, so with that, uh, please welcome back Ruby Lerner. No, I think I'll, I'll be okay. Thanks. Hi, it's so great to be back. Um, I have been coming for six years, um, and this is the third year that we're presenting, and it's been such a uh, joy to watch uh, how much the festival has grown. It gets better and better every year, and I know that you um, appreciate what it means to have an event like this in your city, because this is very, very unusual. So we're just thrilled to be to be back. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Creative Capital, the organization, uh, for just a few minutes because I'm going to get out of the way because I'm really so excited for you to hear from uh, four of our amazing grantees. Um, for those of you who've seen us here before, you know the backstory. We were founded in 1999 at the height of the dot com boom. And that really is what it looked like. Um, as an experiment to see if venture capital concepts could be imported into the cultural arena to support innovative individual artists. So over the last 14 years, we've evolved a comprehensive approach that's radically different from traditional philanthropy, what I call the here's a check, send us a report model of philanthropy. We support artists by providing modest amounts of money throughout a project's life and we couple that with extensive and multifaceted non-monetary support. We expect to work with most projects for, say, a three to five year period, but many of the relationships have gone on longer than a decade. Um, this model of supporting artists has been recognized both in our field, in the arts field. We've had a lot of um, uh, influence in the field over the, the last decade or so. But also in the business world, we were the subject of a major uh, case study for the Harvard Business School. So that was really an honor and really great. Um, to date, we have supported 372 projects representing 463 artists. Um, at a lot of the projects that we work with are collaborative, so that's why the, the number of artists is, is higher. We've committed nearly $25 million in financial support and services to those artists, and a number I'm really proud of is that collectively they've raised more than $12 million following their Creative Capital Awards. And this year alone, their work was seen by more than 10 million people. So it's a lot of achievement um, in this group. It's really amazing. I'm so glad you're impressed because I got really intimidated by the uh, Facebook numbers yesterday. So, um, <laughs> so what is it that we mean when we say we support innovation or innovative artists? So this has a broad meaning for us. So we support um, artists who are pushing the boundaries of traditional forms like dance or, or sculpture. They're also crossing disciplines in their work. They're collaborating with non-artists in fields like sustainable agriculture, technological innovation, or social activism. These artists are working alongside researchers at places like the Harvard Medical School. They're deeply engaged with deep work in communities. And their campaigns are directed at everything from changing the way we eat to revolutionizing the way we're buried. Um, 
Some of you may remember J. Rim Lee. If you were here before, we call her Mushroom Death Suit Girl. Um, so that's, that's J. Rim. Um, we believe that in order to support innovative artists, that as an organization, we actually have to be as innovative, constantly evolving, and as risk-taking as they are. So now, we've come to see ourselves as a permanent laboratory. So we're constantly responding to artists' ever-changing needs and the changes that are going on in the external environment. So what that's meant is that these days, we've always had this engagement model, um, venture capital, venture philanthropy, sometimes called high engagement grant making, we've always been very engaged. But these days, we're even more engaged with our grantees to help them navigate the challenges of a, a difficult economy and kind of a confusing art marketplace. So we not only help them build a team, make a project plan, acquire skills in PR, marketing, fundraising, and strategic planning, but we're also called upon to address very individual project needs that can range from access to car dealerships to airtime during the Super Bowl for a commercial that rebrands communism. <laughs> Here are the happy communists exchanging smiles. So um, nice to know that satire is alive and well. But if anybody could help us get some airtime during Super Bowl, that would be great. Um, <laughs> At a certain point in our trajectory as an organization, we realized that, that parts of, of the approach that we had built could be offered to a broader community of artists, not just the few people we would be supporting with grants. So we could have tried to raise a little bit more money to give a few more grants each year, but instead we built our career development program which offers skills building workshops to artists. In 10 years, we've reached more than 5,000 artists, including some right here in Louisville, and now we're offering workshops in Spanish, we're offering webinars, and so these things are significantly expanding the program's reach. So we've come to think about growth in ways that aren't purely linear. Um, this year, we did something that I've been wanting to do really since the beginning, and now the technology makes it possible. It's called On Our Radar, and it's an online directory that features some of the grant applicants that we're not able to fund. We get great proposals, and we're just not able to fund everyone. Um, we got 3,247 proposals for 46 awards. So what we did was we said, if you made it past that first cut, because it was a pretty tough first cut, that you had the option, if you wanted it, to post a, a brief description of your project with a little thumbnail and email contact information, and we're already getting the stories back about incredible opportunities that have um, happened for artists who didn't even get grants from us, so we're really proud about that. Um, another way that we've grown is through managing three ancillary programs for major foundations. These, pro these foundations have been attracted to the way we work and the way we continue to evolve, and they've asked us to take on managing their programs. So these programs also dramatically expand our reach. So what started as a program to reach a small and very select group of grantees has now become a network of more than 7,000 artists and arts professionals all across the country, and an organization that is now responsible for $9 million in direct support to artists every year, plus the varying levels of advisory services and career training that, that we provide. So as a, a kind of laboratory and um, a constantly ev evolving organization, we've learned some lessons that we think apply um, for individuals, for commercial businesses, and also in the nonprofit arena, and I'm gonna echo some things that we've heard already throughout the conference. Change is a constant. I recently read that we will experience more change in the next 30 years than we have in the past 300. Now, I don't hear people talking about whether we're hardwired as a species for this degree of change, but, um, but it's, it's not going to happen. I think we all know it's already happening. Um, so what does that mean? It means we all have to be flexible. We have to be willing to adjust quickly as the external environment shifts. We have to heed the motto of this very conference and stay curious. That might be the most important skill that we, we can all cultivate. And we have to be ready to try out a lot of new ideas and then analyze, analyze, analyze. Don't be afraid to throw out things that work even when they're really precious to you. Um, we see an organization or a business, we think it can be an art project too. And so we see what we do as its own artistic um, enterprise. Take risks. We strive to disrupt our own technology every day. Um, because if we're not disrupting our own technology, 
somebody else will be disrupting it for us. And I think that's really true in the environment we're, we're in right now. Don't assume that conventional wisdom is what will work for you. Be willing to break away from even your own model. And think creatively about growth. Sometimes the biggest impact might be found, as we've learned, in nonlinear and unconventional methods of growing ideas and organizations. We continue to invest in innovative artists because we believe that artists are central to helping us envision our collective future. It's great when artists are entertaining or entertainment. It's great when there's beautiful work on a wall. But we think that artists have much more to contribute than that and that they can be central to helping us think about our, our future. And we think that as an organization, our work will never be done in finding the most creative ways to support them. And I think you'll see why we're so uh, passionately committed to doing this work when you meet today's artists. So I'm going to tell you just briefly about them. Liz Cohen is a 2005 Visual Arts Awardee. She's exhibited her work nationally and internationally. She's based in Detroit, and she's the artist in residence and head of photography at Cranbrook Academy of Art. Sam Van Aken received an Emerging Fields grant in 2009. His works have been presented at numerous venues, including a very successful exhibition at the 2011 Armory Show in New York. He's the director of the sculpture program at Syracuse University. Hassan Alahi is a 2006 Emerging Fields grantee whose work has not only been exhibited widely in the art world, but it's also landed him at the TED conference at TED Global, and he's just back from the World Economic Forum. He's the director of digital cultures and creativity in the Honors College at the University of Maryland. Tahir Hempill is our newest grantee. He's part of the class of um, 2012, visual arts grantee. His work has also been widely exhibited, including at the Museum of Modern Art. And he's recently left New York for the year to be the Hip Hop Archive Fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard University. All of these artists, plus our wonderful grantee, Sutton Barris Culler, who are here from Seattle and they've been in town for a while, they will have work at the lot, the fabulous lot gallery, Land of Tomorrow. Um, so I hope you'll all join us for the opening at, um, at 6 p.m. Um, have a great time and we'll all be back at the end to answer um, questions. Thanks. Hello, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of IdeaFest for having us. This is uh, an amazing event and I'm so happy to be a part of it. I'm just gonna set this up really quickly. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna run through a couple of projects for you. My background is in documentary photography and I tend to carry out projects that are extended investigations about labor, groups of men, and the lanes people will go through, including myself, to feel loved and accepted as members of different groups. This is the cover of an uh, artist book that documents a group of tattooers who happen to be motorcycle riders, militia members, and miniature animal breeders. <laughs> the following images come from a four-year investigation called Canal, where I documented the lives of transgender, transgender sex workers on the fringe of the former U.S. Canal Zone. Their bodies became a metaphor for the geography of Panama and the politics in the region. As we became closer, they began to dress me up. But ultimately, I couldn't be a member because I wasn't willing to do sex work, I'm not a biological male, and I didn't need or want to be transgender. I went back to the U.S. and expanded my documentary practice to include performances, and I, I, told the I told stories that were gathered from the interviews I had done when I was in Panama. Um, a series of events led me to purchase an East German Trabant in Berlin in 2002. The Trabant was produced in East Germany from 1959 to 1991 during the socialist era. It embodied the East German values of utility, simplicity, and resourcefulness. Its two-stroke engine had only seven moving parts, and as fiberglass was unavailable, the car's panels were made with waste products mixed with resin. In the beginning, the waste products were shredded wool from military uniforms, and later they used paper waste. 
I decided to bring the car back to the United States and turn, turn it into an El Camino in order to become a fringe member of American custom car culture. If the Trabant was the utopian East German car, the El Camino was the utopian American car. Also produced during the Cold War period, the El Camino was the one-stop shopping car. It had the speed of a muscle car, the comfort of a sedan, and the utility of a pickup truck. Like all things utopian, these cars also expose the pitfalls of what is lost in translation from big idea to tangible product. The Trabants were stinky and slow, and although they were meant to be cheap, and cheap to manufacture in the hopes that every East German would have one, people waited on lists for years in order to get one. As for the El Camino, you simply can't have it all in one package. The car didn't do any of the things it set out to do well. A full load into the flatbed of an early El Camino could crack its frame. The Trabant arrived in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I apprenticed under Bill Cherry to learn the ins and outs of metal fabrication and car customizing. I tried out bikini modeling so that I could represent the car I was building, unlike the models representing cars that are not their own. <laughs> I learned how to use Bill's tools and over an eight-year period worked on the car at various shops around the country. When I got to Bill, I didn't know how to weld, had never used tools powered by compressed air, and knew very little about cars. These following two slides give a glimpse into the process of building what would be called the Trabant Tamino. I decided that if a Trabant were ever to have some El Camino-ness, it would have to change its heart, its engine. The two-stroke engine would be traded out for a Chevy small block. It would go from being front-wheel drive to rear-wheel drive, its wheelbase, the distance between the wheels, would have to expand by approximately three feet, and the total length of the car would have to grow an additional three feet. I began using the same hydraulic technology used in low riders to make the Trabant Tamino. The transformation would be difficult. The Trabant's memory of where it came from could not be erased. The following video is from the first day I tested the hydraulic system in the Trabant Tamino. During the process of transforming the Trabant, I went to Zwickau, Germany to pay homage to the 30,000 workers that built 3 million Trabants in 30 years and had their livelihoods pulled out from under them. This factory was a Horstwerks factory before World War II. August Horst was the Henry Ford of Germany. I moved to Detroit, the home of GM, and worked on a build plate at a custom car shop. The car, was manufactured, the car that was manufactured in Zwickau appropriately finished its custom build in a city with a similar post-industrial condition, Detroit, USA. Here is the Trabantamino's interior, the engine compartment, the chrome chassis, and a view from the wheel well. The stages of building the car and its pinup documentation became markers of transformative moments in my life. Here I am pregnant with the Trabantamino. Oops.
embarked on a journey with my new family. <laughs> I embarked on a journey with my new family to, to test drive the car for the first time in Texas. Here we are, Trabantamino and El Camino, en route from Marfa to the Mexican border. I photographed a Trabantamino on the Rio Grande in recognition of the immigrant history it had borrowed its, hydraulically te its hydraulic technology from. A Trabant can never be an El Camino. It retains its past on its way to a destiny it can only approach. The process of building the Trabantamino was a celebration of what can happen when one exists in the margins or on the fringe. It is a recognition of the innovation that happens in an effort to belong. It is a gesture that hopefully shows that states of in-betweenness incubate new ideas and that perhaps the expression of individuality is often the best way to genuinely connect. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, what makes Creative Capital really extraordinary is the support and belief they have in their artists. Um, my own project has gone through numerous iterations from radio towers to grafted fruit trees, and even at times when I was questioning sort of what I was doing, they never lost faith in me. Um, so thank you. The, um, my Creative Capital project evolved out of a piece I did for a residency in Berlin. And I was really interested in how Germans are fascinated by the myth of the cowboy. And um, so I started watching all these westerns leading up to the residency. And I found this one western, it was made in the 60s, and there's this cowboy riding across the desert. And he, um, you know, in the background you can just faintly see a palm tree. And I was like, wow, okay, I, I need to look at this incongruity. And I found out that a lot of the B Westerns, in addition to the spaghetti Westerns, were actually filmed on the former sets of epic, the Hollywood epics, like Cleopatra, Ben-Hur. And um, so um, sort of following that same logic, I decided to film a Western in Berlin. And um, to sort of collapse that myth of the cowboy into, uh, into Berlin itself. And I guess that really kind of sums up my process. I, I think it's the fact that I spent much of my youth in, um, in hardcore punk shows. But the, uh, the idea of when you interrupt the order of things, when you collapse distinctions, and when you bring one thing sharply up against its opposite, it creates the, uh, it creates the potential for, for new ideas to emerge. And so with this Western, I was, um, I started filming things like the cowboy trying to lasso a bronze horse at the Alts Museum, uh, taking a bath in a hotel room that Stalin stayed at, uh, this scene where uh, playing harmonica at Walter Benjamin Platz, and then another scene where I'm actually riding a pony around the Reichstag. And while filming that scene, a photographer comes up to me and asks if he can take a photograph, which I didn't think I really didn't give it any thought until the next day when I started receiving emails from school teachers and in Tokyo and retirees in New Zealand. And I found out that the, uh, the photograph actually went out on Reuters, the international newswire, and was published in papers around the globe. So, um, and the amazing thing with, with the emails that I was getting is that these, um, these people were, um, they were essentially creating the narrative for, for the work, and it made me think of how an artwork could function like a rumor or a meme. And that ultimately led to the idea of a hoax. And so a hoax is really interesting because in a hoax, it changes the narrative of place, and it also changes the way that you act on the everyday, giving the ordinary things new significance. And so I started with the most famous of hoaxes, the 1939 War of the Worlds broadcast, and I traveled to Grover's Mills, New Jersey, where I found this tower in the backyard of what was at one point the, the Grover family house. Now this tower is really interesting because on the night of the broadcast, um, this was a, at first this was a windmill that was converted into a water tower, but on the night of the broadcast it became an alien ship. The residents of Grover's Mills, listening to the radio broadcast, finding out that aliens had landed in the center of town, got their guns, went to the center of town, 
mistook this for the alien ship as it's described in the, the radio drama and started blasting holes in it. <laughs> and so I went to, you know, I stopped at the door of the, the current owner of the house and, um, you know, I asked to take pictures and she was sort of floored by that because apparently this is some sort of sci-fi shrine and people sneak onto her property and take pictures and somebody slipped on a pool cover and then she said, well, do you want the tower? So, the tower became the centerpiece of the first iteration of my creative capital project. Turning it from a windmill to a water tower to an alien ship, I turned it into a radio broadcast antenna and set up a portable sound stage with uh, that small little FM transmitter in the bottom corner and began to do my own series of hoaxes. Now, in and amongst like, stories of flesh-eating viruses and free car washes, um, the project didn't have much longevity because the FCC really doesn't like that because what I was doing is jumping on commercial, uh, commercial radio stations like <laughs> classic rock um, and uh, country. Those were, those were sort of my targets. Um, so the project kind of had an end there. Um, and so I was looking at this idea of the hoax a little bit more and I found out that the term hoax actually comes from hocus pocus, which in turn comes from hoc est corpus meum, which is a line in the Catholic Eucharist, and it's where the priest says, this is my body over the bread, and turns it into the literal body of Christ. Okay, so any of you um, who've had communion, you know that this isn't a symbol of Christ, this is actually Christ. So, and the whole process is known as transubstantiation. So I was going, how could I transubstantiate a thing? How can I take something like a tower, or a piece of bread, or a tree, have its appearance remain the same, but alter its reality? And so this is my project entitled A Tree of 40 Fruit. And so it's a grafted fruit tree that has the capacity to grow over 40 different types of fruits from the family of stone fruits, including peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, and cherries. And I've even been playing around with almonds a little bit. But, so throughout the majority of the year, it, it appears to be a normal fruit tree until spring when it blossoms <laughs> in variegated tones. And then again in spring, oh, thank you. Um, so then again in, in summer when you pick all these different fruit off of it. And the, the, relying on the symbolism of the tree, um, the number 40, which throughout history, and particularly within religion, is used to mean a multitude. Um, the idea is that I place these trees and they create a new narrative within a space. So I started, um, I started, started with an addition of 25 trees, and this is an image of the trees from the Armory Show. Now the Armory Show is in March, and I wanted to get the trees to blossom, so I brought them in early. And part of doing that, uh, it, this sort of looks really futuristic, but it isn't. Um, I consulted some horticultural experts, um, mainly people that grow marijuana in their attic, <laughs> and um, they turned me on to these fluorescent tubes and the mylar, and so the trees were in blossom. So this is my small nursery um, where I start the trees, and I develop them through a process called chip grafting. So I take tiny little buds off of one tree, I slice it into a, a, you know, an equally sized incision on the tree that I'm trying to graft to. I tape it. Um, I let it sit all winter, prune it back, and then you see the growth on the right. And that's just within one season. Um, an odd direction that the project took is that it became a form of conservancy. Um, I found out that there's hundreds, if not thousands, of different varieties of, of stone fruits. And a lot of these heirloom species are disappearing. They, um, um, so this is from the New York State Agriculture Experiment Station, um, and they were tearing out this orchard, and what I've been able to do is take some of the money from selling my trees and to keep this orchard going, and it's one of the only archives of, um, of plums that's left on the East Coast. Um, and so this is what the trees look like when they're planted on the left, and then this is what they look like after one year of growth. And so all of the branches on that tree are, um, are different varieties, that you can see. 
Um, since the trees only last 30 to 50 years, um, they're kind of ephemeral. So I make these grafted uh, tree tags as a means to um, kind of become a record of the tree. And to give you an idea of the different types of fruit, this is just um, a selection of plums from one week of, um, of my nursery. So I would like to thank Creative Capital. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like the number one fan. Um, it's, I would say it's the single best thing I've, I've been able to do as an artist. So thank you. Thanks, Sam. Howdy, folks. So I'm Hassan, and uh, I often, oh, let's get this thing to play, and of course we're going to get the, uh, the beach ball. So uh, hi there. Um, you know, a lot of times as artists, we know we get asked, to, hey, uh, what type of art do you do? Or what type of an artist are you? And you know what? I have no idea, and I'm perfectly OK with that. But uh, you know, it's one of the things is that uh, I'm perfectly OK with not knowing, because it's something that I'm allowed to experiment here, there, there, and there. But one thing that I am absolutely certain of is that I'm really interested in art that barely passes for art, and some of the things that somehow may not necessarily be considered in the, in the, or fall in the traditional role of art. Uh, what you're looking at back here is a project that I started uh, about almost 10 years ago uh, after I was erroneously reported as a terrorist, or terrorist suspect. Ter you know, suspect. I have to clarify that part. I, um, you know, and it wasn't really intended as an art project when I started it. What it basically was was this real pragmatic reaction to a situation. And uh, I spent six months of my life with the FBI justifying every moment of my existence, convincing them, look, guys, I'm not a terrorist. Uh, I got, you know, somebody called up and said there's some funny looking guy who had explosives. Never mind, I didn't have explosives. But, you know, you know if you see something, say something, even if it's wrong. So. Uh, thus started this whole thing. But in the, uh, anyway, so at the end I was cleared after uh, nine consecutive polygraphs and uh, yeah, in one sitting. It was uh, kind, of, kind of bizarre, you know, it's like, uh, you know, is today Tuesday? Is your name Hassan? Do you belong to any groups that wish to harm the United States? All sorts of things. And uh, fortunately I was okay, you know, I was uh, uh, after the whole thing. And of course, you know, you're never really cleared of these things because in order to be formally cleared, you have to be formally charged and well, that didn't exactly happen. So uh, you know, at the end, uh, the, the FBI agent's like, yeah, everything's fine. I was like, well, guys, uh, can I get a letter saying everything's fine? Because all we need is the last guy not to get the last memo. <laughs> and uh, here we go all over again. And of course, they couldn't. But say, no, here's some phone numbers. You give us a call. If, if you get into trouble, we'll, we'll take care of it. So ever since then, before I would go anywhere, I'd call my FBI agent. And I'd say, hey, guys, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing. And it's not that I had to do this, but I chose to do this. So I said, I, I, I told him, look, I don't want to raise any red flags, don't want to make it look like I'm making any sudden moves, but this is where I am, this is what I'm going to be doing. And they're like, thank you, uh, we'll pass this on to the local guys. And then, you know, those phone calls turned to emails, and then emails got longer with pictures, and then I'd make websites for my FBI agent, send him all this stuff, and all sorts of, all sorts of details. And I'd write pages and pages and pages, and I'd always get back, thank you, be safe. <laughs> so... You know, it was, a, it was a really unbalanced relationship. <laughs> and here I am, like, giving and giving and giving. You, 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 you've been in something like that? You know, you give and you give, and they just don't reciprocate like that. So I just think, you know, oh, wait a minute. Why, why is it that the FBI agent only gets to know about what I'm doing? So uh, this is almost 10 years ago. I wrote this uh, really clunky piece of code, and I basically turned my phone into, into a tracking device. Uh, or I guess these days it would be called an app. And it basically told everything of what I was doing from every air, air, airport uh, that I was transiting through to my flights since birth, all these bits and pieces of every possible data. So what it basically got to me, my thinking was, all right, guys, you guys want to watch me? I'm perfectly OK with that. But I can watch myself better than you guys ever could. And I could get such a level of detail, including you know, where I did my thing on J January 17th of 2008. You know, it's like, hey, I'm all, about, I'm all about full disclosure. I'm going to tell you every little bit. But, you know, so it, it really what's happening is there's about 50,000 pieces of evidence of everything that I've done, everywhere that I've been, and all these are threaded and attract, and, and it's kind of like a database. And when you're looking at the uh, project, it's not really in anything, 
it's not really in a concise, clean way of doing it. You're just getting all the information, and you have to do the, you have to play the role of the FBI agent and cross-reference this database with that database with that database with that database. And when you look at the images, I mean, these images really could be anywhere, but they're not. They're incredibly specific. If you know exactly where that hotel or where that bed is, that actually has a very different meaning. Or in the case of this exact highway sign, or when you saw the sign for the, uh, well, this image right over here on top, I mean, we kind of know where that is, but if anyone else is looking at it, it outside of this arena, it's very difficult to actually recognize. So there's this incredible specificity, incredible generality to it at the same time. But really, what I'm really talking, so in this, uh, the other things that are also included are all my financial data, all my, uh, um, my transportation logs, my phone records, everything's public. And really what it's come down to is by putting it all out there, I've actually, I live this incredibly anonymous and private life. Uh, you know, so it's, it's so, you know, in this era where everything is tracked and everything is archived, my, my, my thing is like the way you actually, uh, the way you protect your privacy is that you give it up. Because what's gonna happen is, in, 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 the, in the amount of information that's out there, let's take the FBI for example. So one of the things is that the reason the FBI, uh, the information that they have has value is because no one else has access to it. So if we cut out the middleman, and if I just, just give you the information, then the, FBI, then the information the FBI has about me has zero value. And I, I understand that on an individual basis, this is merely symbolic, but if 300 million people started doing this, we would force a restructuring of the entire intelligence system. <laughs> and you know, we're seeing this already happen. You know, when I first started this project, people thought I was crazy. And actually, this is the great thing about creative capital, because prior to that point, no one wanted to touch this with a 10-foot pole because of the political uh, nature of this work uh, nearly 10 years ago. And shortly after creative capital got, uh, it gave, it gave it support, other people started uh, following up on it. And uh, really, 10 years ago, uh, people thought I was crazy. I, there was, I had a meeting with, a, with a, this woman at a telecom company that t told me I was crazy, and this was creepy, and there's no way anyone would want to post photos and maps of where they are and everything else. Well, you know, not even that many years later, and there's nearly a billion people on Facebook doing this. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting how, you know, what started out as an art project has really normalized into daily life. There's really nothing spectacularly uh, different about it because we're all doing this, whether we're aware of this or not. And really what I'm, what I'm really getting at with this project is that it's, regardless of whether we're aware or not, I think one of the things that's happening is that, when, uh, is that we're all creating archives and we need to take control over our own data because if we don't identify ourselves, other people will and almost always that's going to be inaccurate. So thank you very much and move on to the next person. Good job, good job, good job. Small gathering of a few friends. My name is Tahir Hemphill. I am a 2012 Creative Capital grantee. And the name of my project is the Hip Hop Word Count, which is an online searchable database built from the lyrics and language of over, so far, 50,000 hip hop songs from 1979 to current day. So, a little background on, um, on how I came to do this. Um, I was raised and groomed to be an engineer by my family, um, elementary school, high school, and college. And around college, decided I wanted to do art. <laughs> so, subsequently, all of the art I do is informed by science. And, um, and I love hip hop. I love hip hop. Um, so right now there are about 50,000 songs in the database, about 3,000 artists, about 5,000 albums. Um, it was not my cell phone. And the way um, I break down the, the information, what the data and the metadata, there's um, of course artist name, song title, album title. I have geolocations for all the artists. Um, it defaults to where they represent, um, not where they're born. So Tupac was born in New York, but he represents um, California. Um, of course, release dates, the number of total words, um, the number of polysyllabic words, average syllables per word, average letters per syllable, and the education level, the reading level, you need to be able to read the lyrics with understanding from elementary to post postgraduate. 
Um, so in, in, in a sense, um, the content of hip hop is now tagged for location and time. So it gives a different context. So every utterance in hip hop has a location on earth and a time and space when it happened. So it gives a different context to listening to and understanding hip hop. And, and, and this is the way that me and my friends um, um, listen to it and, and interpret it and, um, and enjoy it. So since it's all in data form now, um, I guess the first, the first stages of making art from it were, um, were, were was, um, to do data visualization. So right here, you have um, an analysis of 50 Cent's entire career and Jay-Z's entire career. Every line is a, is a song, and it's a parallel coordinate analysis. So the first coordinate, the first line is year, and then it's sentence count, and then it gets into um, readability scores. Um, and on the bottom, you have Jay-Z. So in this, in this way, you can start to chart and compare, like truly compare rappers and, and, and their styles and their influence. Um, this is um, a text correlation tool looking at a battle between, a famous battle between Nas and Jay-Z. Um, Nas's ether is um, to the right, Jay-Z's the takeover is to the left, and the words that they use to diss each other are in the middle. The words that Jay-Z uses exclusively to diss Nas are over to the left, and the words that Nas uses to diss Jay-Z are over to the right. And since, um, again, since the data is in, since the lyrics are in data form, or the information is in data form, we could do cool things like um, map um, Staten Island rappers. So we started to get into like the geography of the language in hip hop. Like how does slang, where does slang start? How does it travel? Um, that type of stuff. So I did a, a search of Kentucky rappers. This is not an, an exhaustive list. <laughs> but a few, a few popped up. And um, so one of the other projects um, that came out of it was um, a database called Champagne Always Stains My Silk, and it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a database looking at all of the um, rapper brand mentions of champagne and hip hop from 1980 to 2010. So on one hand, we all know like you know the image of rappers in champagne, but if you look at um, if you consider champagne as an aspirational product, then you could dig deeper into like cultural research and 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 look at uh, when rappers choose to celebrate, how they choose to celebrate. And, um, and that led me to further, actually further research um, into, that, into that, um, that subject. And this is a really cool quote from DJ Premier, and, and it's, it's simple and, and profound. He says, the one thing he loves about hip hop is that you have to know how to listen to it. So on one hand, well, there, like, a few years ago, there was a Cristal Gate, and there was like beef between um, Jay Z and the product managers of Cristal Champagne. And there was an article in The Economist, and MTV kind of instigated the um, instigated the beef, um, and it got back to Jay Z, and he basically was upset that the um, Cristal wasn't really happy with hip hop's. Um, relationship um, to their brand. So he started a campaign himself um, in videos and in his songs. Um, on the left you see he, you know, he, in, in one of his videos for Show Me What You Got, he, um, the bartender brings him a bottle of Cristal to, his, um, to the gambling table and he waves it off. And then he opens up a case of his own champagne, Ace of Spades. Um, so he's a businessman. Um, and actually, you could see the effect of his campaign on the popularity of Cristal. So that happened, um, that's basically the drop off. It happened in, um, that happened in 2006, and by the summer of 2007, the popularity of Cristal um, dropped off in hip hop. No one, no one else was rapping about it. They were rapping about probably Ace of Spades. So next steps. Um, 
I was, um, I'm currently at Harvard um, doing a research fellowship um, at the Du Bois Institute. And um, some of the cultural research I'm doing, one um, is getting back to the art and making sculptural representations of the data. So um, what do these results look like in physical form? What does it feel like to be in a room surrounded by um, 90s hip hop as opposed to you know, hip hop from 2010? And also, what, is the, what does it sound like? What does the data sound like um, abstracted in abstracted form? Is there a tone for you know, Southern hip hop? Is there a specific tone for um, West Coast or East Coast hip hop? And also using the, the text in a jigsaw method to, to take apart and rebuild into, um, into a different narrative. Um, and these are, some of the, so these are some of the projects that I'll, I'll be working on this year in, in, in Boston. And the data viz is up at staplecrops.com um, slash champagne. And this is uh, all my contact info. Thank you. <laughs>